Hey, it's Mazzy here. I really wanted to do the top 25 British bands. After doing that video of the top 25 American bands, that was very easy for me to do, even though uh, you all mentioned bands that I did not include, which is great because we all have different tastes and uh, we grew up in different times and are in different uh, genres we're into. And there's some that I left off. And just for everyone, just to let's settle this right now. I got more comments on, you forgot the band, or the bands from Canada, except for Lee Bon Elm. So the band wouldn't have been included. This was supposed to be the video of my top 25 British bands. I couldn't do it. I surrender. I failed. I saw Vinyl Richie do one, and he did a great one. He missed a lot of bands, too. But of course you're going to do it. So I just went through my collection and it came out to 40 albums. I'm not going to put them in order. I'm just going to go through them really fast and just give you a little take on these bands. And there's bands that I didn't include that I just thought, eh, I don't know. Seriously, I thought of not including Oasis. I know people in England are just, you know, creaming in their jeans for next year's uh, Gallagher Brother reunion and the Oasis and all that. And I know how popular they were, the biggest band of the of the 1990s, 2000s. I saw them in a little club in San Francisco. But um, what's the story, Morning Glory? You know, there's that song Wonderwall where they got the name from the George Harrison soundtrack of the same name movie, film. And uh, they're so like up, their heads are so up the ass of the Beatles. And they want to be the Beatles. And, and, uh, and I actually enjoy Oasis. They have a sound, a thickness to their music. And um, I don't think they have a lot of diverse music, really. All their music, when you take their, what, four, five, six albums, whatever it is, I have, actually, I have them all. And it kind of, it's like this set, you could pick one and it's the same as the other one, except, but they have good hooks. So I'll give a credit to them. But uh, I most did not include them, but I'm including them because this is just a, a little bit of a shit show video anyway. Then the Buzzcocks. I got to show the Buzzcocks. Great kind of punk band. Uh, more than a punk band, UK band. I saw them once when they came through San Francisco. Uh, this is a different kind of tension, a different kind of tension. Do you say it twice or is it just the type twice? Is it type? Is it type twice? Uh, it's only once on the spine. So the Buzzcocks. Let's talk about um, records, British music. I am an Anglophile, and I actually, you know, the the whole thing with music for me and most people in my generation, if it wasn't for the Beatles coming to America, the 1964 British in, uh, invasion. Then there's uh, Depeche Mode. Of course, uh, this is a great album. Uh, what is this called? I should know this. Oh, Circuit Violator, Violator. It's very early in the morning when I'm recording this. So Violator, Depeche Mode. You know, I was not all in on them. I'm still not all in on them. I love this album, Violator. Uh, of course... I kind of came in backwards, which sounds kind of creepy even saying that on video. Personal Jesus. Yeah. Personal Jesus. But I love this record. What a great record. I have, I think I have three of their albums. But um, I wasn't all in at the time of Depeche Mode. I, that's my main, main thing to tell you, to explain to you. Uh, a band I actually love, and I remember, I, I went to a photo shoot in San Francisco with my photographer, Michelle Clement. Uh, this is my original UK copy of Jesus and Mary Chain Cycle Candy. Um, it was for Rolling Stone. They were staying at the Beck Motel on Marcus Street near Castro, and they were playing that night, and they, this album had just come out. And I went along just because I wanted to go along and, and you know meet the brothers and see what it was like, and obviously they were very young then. And I think the photo shoot was scheduled for 11 a.m. to show up at the Beck Motel, and they were asleep. They didn't answer. Uh, we got a call back later uh, from the management, I think, or PR, or whatever, and it was rescheduled for about 6 o'clock. So, um, you know, they didn't show up for the shoot. They slept through it. Udi Blues, definitely, and this 1967 album. This is my favorite. You know, they kind of changed even more so after this, and uh, their first album, Denny Lane, was in it with the song Go Now, more blues-based band, and that's why they named themselves the Moody Blues, but this is that first lush orchestration thing, Nights in White Satin, Tuesday Afternoon. I just, I still adore this record. I love how it sounds. Um, they got sort of semi-pretentious after this, even though I like all those Threshold of a Dreams and Timothy Leary's Dead and all. I do like that a lot, but this one, I always go back to, I reach for this first. Um, but they were a great band. This is with the London Festival Orchestra, conducted by Peter Knight, Moody Blues.
This is more fun than doing a ranking because, you know, you, how do, music is not a competition. It shouldn't be, as I've done it many times before. Uh, one of my all-time favorite bands. This would have been maybe in the top 10 if I had ranked them. XTC, and this is English Settlement. Uh, uh, Andy Partridge is a genius. And uh, Tempestuous uh, Career, because he wouldn't tour, is afraid of flying and nervous being on stage and all that stuff. I did see him at a club called The Stone in San Francisco. I'm trying to think what year that was. Um, so I did see them once, thank goodness, but they've never made a bad album. Obviously some better than others, but uh, XTC, English Settlement from, is it Swinton? Swindon? Swindon. Swindon's famous because of XTC. Dire Straits, I mean, this to me is their best album. I know people like the Over Gold and you know, the digital album that everyone had to buy a CD player to buy, but this was so different sounding than any band, and this is right in the midst of the punk new wave scene. It was in 1978, this came out. I remember coming back from England, my first trip, and my girlfriend, who worked at a radio station in San Francisco, got promos, and this was in the bin of the promo bin. I was so hungry to play some new releases after several months in, in Europe, and I remember putting this on, and that guitar thing, um, when I, listened, when I heard um, Sultan's A Swing, I just, uh, this guy was an amazing, a very unique guitar player. And in the vein, you know, I like guitar players like Ry Cooter and J.J. Kale. There's a certain style of music and playing. And I just think, uh, you know, he, he nails it. And I like Mark Knopfler's uh, playing quite a bit. And I love that record. That's my favorite record of them. Now, another band um, that I quite like that never really caught on big in in the US, they were obviously big in the UK, burned brightly for a short time, and it's a, a great power trio, power pop, new wavy trio, the jam. What a great record, All Mods Con. Uh, this is my promo copy from my record store days, and I loved this record. I followed um, uh, this band for that for their very short career. I have all their records, and then, um, and then they kind of like, poof, and then, all those other projects uh, that happened um, after the jam. Another band that split up just before this album came out. Great band, great singles, but this is probably one of the best albums of that period, 1968, is Odyssey and Oracle of Zombies. Uh, it's so sad that, you know, they kind of split up and then this record became a hit in America, at least a single, and only due to... Uh, to Al Cooper, who brought some imports back and listened to this and, and kind of talked Clive Davis into releasing as a single. And it became pretty much of a hit. I didn't get the album right away because I got the single, She's Not There. And uh, it's such a, a wonderful, wonderful song. Not She's Not There, I'm sorry. Time of the Season. I mistakenly, I said the wrong name, basically. But every song on here, this is Beautiful Harmonies. Uh, it's like, a, it is a perfect pop rock psychedelic baroque album odyssey and oracle they would probably be if i was rating the top 40 since i have 40 records here they probably would be in the um 30s to 40s and see that's why you can't compare because they're a great band and how can you compare like that against a prog band like yes um i got into them their first album i love up until uh that debacle double piece of shit album, Tales from a Topographic Ocean. Uh, this is probably their masterpiece for me, but I like their first album. I like the Yes album, uh, but Fragile is a, is a wonderful record. Um, yes, Prague. Now this would have been one of my top five bands and that's The Who, and this, is, this and Tommy are my favorite albums. I know a lot of people of my generation and the younger generations, I love, Who's next? More anthematic, more you know, stadium rock. To me, this is quirky. This is funny. This is has the their best song that Peter uh, that Pete Townsend's ever written. The best recorded record I can see for miles. That to me is the best song they've ever done. With this kind of mock of uh, advertising, uh, the who who sell out. They literally did on that record in a great way. Wonderful record. But they would be my top five bands ever. Another band. Might be in the 30 to 40 or 20 to 30 range. And I saw them twice, uh, at both at Winterland, I think. And this is uh, 
10 years after. I mean, they were the blues based jazz. They got a little jazz thing, uh, blues based British bands of the late sixties into the seventies. Um, of course, uh, you know, they kind of whimpered after Woodstock. They had the, I'd love to change the world. That was big. And they kind of like faltered, unfortunately. But Alvin Lee, what a great guitar player. And I, I just think this is an amazing record. All the records are good and they're relatively cheap to get. But unlike the Yardbirds or Led Zeppelin, they had a little jazzy thing going occasionally, which I think added and made them totally unique. One of the best live bands I've ever seen. And it just was really great. 10CC, they might make my top 15 to 20. And this is, uh, of course, the big hit One Night. Um, well, it has the sweet One Night in Paris, but it has, of course, the classic I'm Not in Love. As schmaltzy as that is, it was totally groundbreaking. Came out a very similar, uh, unbeknownst to, oh, I just realized I didn't include Queen. See, people are going to say, you didn't include Queen. I didn't include Queen. But uh, Bohemian Rhapsody and, and this came out like around the same time, the whole multi-layered vocal, like, you know, 10,000 overdubs or something like that. Uh, but every member of this band, all four members are great musicians and friggin' great vocalists. I don't know any other band, ABBA maybe, uh, that has four perfect vocalists. Any other band, name them. I, can you? Aside from a vocal group, like we're talking like doo-wop groups or vocal groups or solo group, The Temptation, things like that, a rock band that all four members are perfect vocalists. I don't know it. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Now, Wales is part of the UK, right? This would be in my top 20 bands, definitely. Super Furry Animals, Rings Around the World. I think when this came out, there was a DVD, DVD version. It might be the first surround rock album and i've heard that surround version in a great surround setup it's friggin amazing i've heard it a bunch of times i don't think i need to hear it again i'm not really a surround music guy but they're kind of um psychedelic art rock uh with uh beats and electronica mixed in um some dance music mixed in sometimes but uh, you know griff reese the, the the main singer they're really kind of i don't know if they're hiatus or split up He's doing solo albums. Uh, the rest of the band has their own thing going on. But um, I love Super for Animals, saw them three times. Fantastic. I almost didn't include the Sex Pistols because of this one album. That's it. Done and gone, aside from, you know, other projects and comps and movie soundtrack. This is an original UK copy with the blank cover. Um but this is such a great album, and it's a pivotal album, an important album, and I saw that last Winterland show. It weren't very good. You know, they mocked the audience, weren't very good. Well, that's what punk's about a little bit. But, um, yeah, I had to because of the importance of the band. But this is a great album. But does one-off make a great British album, great British artist? You decide. Now, a band that I think... Uh, Needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce them to you because it's their debut, Roxy Music. Uh, Phil Manzanera, Brian Ferry, Brian Eno, um, Graham Simpson, Paul Thompson, Rick Kenton, Sea Breezes on here. Uh, I mean, Virginia Plains, that's the first song I heard, and then Sea Breezes, and I just love this, and I love their... Uh, Brian Ferry kind of art directed somewhat these uh, these women on the cover of the series of the records. As much as I like the later stuff, Avalon, I love Avalon and I like the slickness. They're beautiful records and you can't deny how great those records, but I kind of prefer the arty, edgier stuff, first few albums with Eno, um, where they're not as slick. But Avalon is is a wonderful record and the one is the one before it when they do a great cover of the birds eight miles high and midnight hour now this band would definitely make my top 10 the smiths they burn brightly for a short time what five albums four albums five albums um a live album and uh i don't know if i can always name a, a favorite of mine but the queen is dead certainly is amongst them uh, I just love this. The boy with the thorn in his side. Frankly, Mr. Shankly, the queen is dead. Vicar and a tutu. There's a light that never goes out. Some girls are better than others. I mean, the whole lyric 
lyrical content of Morrissey just amuses me. Even though he's a wanker most of the time, his lyrics are great. Johnny Moore's guitar playing is totally original. He's one of those rhythmic players that has, like, his leads are really more rhythmic than lead guitar solos. And he just nails it. And it's more original than almost any other guitar rock player I can think of. He's not just doing the solos. Now, Beggar's Banquet's my favorite Rolling Stones album. And, of course, the Rolling Stones would be in my top ten. But they would they make... They'd be in the top five. They'd be number... Probably number four, three or four. That's all I'll say about that. Saw them maybe eight, nine times. Now, to me, this is, this might be the best rock album to come out the last 25 years. And this is Kid A, and this is Radiohead. I love this record. I know a lot of people say, I really like the more guitar-driven records, uh, Pablo Honey and the first uh, OK Computer, which is that crossover album which was number one on all the lists of that particular year. 2001, this came out, and I put this on on a CD, and I was just gobsmacked. I just hadn't heard quite like it. Electronica, uh, um, that vocal effects uh, they do. I just, everything is right place. What a great opening track. This, to me, is a perfect album. I just remember having a CD in my car all the time, and my son then was 11 years old, and him and I, uh, it was our favorite album, and it was in the machine, in the machine, for months playing that record. He loved that record, and uh, so we bonded. So there's, there, you know, obviously that memory of that uh, with your young son. But uh, Radiohead Kid A, a great record. Now, I almost really didn't pull the police, but then I realized, come on. I mean, especially this time. This is before you had the wanker. Uh, uh, back and forth that we knew about with Stuart Copeland and Sting. The, um, have you ever seen, like, when they did the reunion? Like, he just needles him so much, gets his goat. Um, but, you know, Roxanne, I saw them when this came out in a medium-sized venue, and they were friggin' great. What a great trio. You can't deny they made great records. Um, this is a promo copy, original promo copy, but you can't deny they make great records, but for some reason, I don't pull them out as much as I used to. And except for maybe one CD of uh, Sting solo, something about Sting. Sting, playing Sting records is like playing Don Henley records. There's a certain thing that just, it's the personality gets in a way. And I like both of them. They're amazing, amazingly talented musicians, but there's something about Sting, you know, but he's great. And so that's my problem, not his. Sorry, Sting. A great album, uh, and a different take on punk music and traditional Irish music are the Pogues. And um, any record you grab of theirs is great. What a tempestuous um, life <laughs> here. Uh, this is produced by Steve Lillywhite, who is like the producer du jour around this whole period. Uh, Shane McGowan, of course, uh, the main singer, and uh, we just lost him in the last year. Uh, one of the great Irish, English Irish uh, writers and singers. And, um, you know, he lived and he wrote the way he lived. And I would argue that his Christmas song, Fairy Tale in New York, is one of the top 10 Christmas songs of all time. Uh, but anyway, the Pogues, wonderful record, wonderful band. I saw them once in a club back many years ago. Now, in my top 10 would be Procol Harum. And if you only could pick one album, this might be it. Uh, Salty Dog, this is their, what, third album? Uh, I like Shine On Brightly quite a bit. And you can't deny the greatness of The Wider Shade of Pale. They would make the list just for that song alone. But, um, you know, they went through member changes. But I like this period with Matthew Fisher on the, on the organ and, of course, uh, uh, Gary Booker, who we also lost in the last year or two, and um, Robin Trower on guitar. I mean, he when they kind of split in different ways, they lost that magic. They still made great records, but they lost that magic. Not terrible records by any stretch. E.J. Wilson is that um, drummer who is, to me, one of the great semi-unknown drummers. 
he rocks it. If you listen to, even though not those other artists are in it, if you listen to live and uh, the live album that came out, that was kind of a hit with Conquistador. The drumming on that is amazing. He drives that band with that orchestra on that, and it's kind of up front or to the side a little bit, and it's excellent. Pink Floyd, of course, and Metal is probably my favorite album, but you can't deny the greatness of Pink Floyd. The Sid Barrett years are obviously wonderful, in a di almost like a different band, even with that one member change. Uh, but uh, Pink Floyd, what else can I say about them? I just love that I saw them, what, four or five months before Dark Side of the Moon, and they performed the entire Dark Side, and uh, we hadn't heard it yet, but it was great. Uh, the Damned. To me, this is like one of the great first punk albums out of the UK that I acquired, at least. I think this is, what, the year before the Sex Pistols? Is it 76, 77? Sex Pistols was 77. So uh, this is, they predate the Sex Pistols, and I think... They're a better band. They morphed into something else after this. They got a little more new wavy and uh, electronic, I guess, commercial in a different way. Produced by Nick Lowe. What a great cover. What a great band. And when we listen to it today, it's not that outrageous. I mean, we thought that punk was so different, so uh, in your face, which it was, but it, it almost seems tame by today's standards. Led Zeppelin. Would Led Zeppelin make my top 10? Probably not. And I love Led Zeppelin, but I'm not like an all-in, like, oh, my God. Um, and I don't even mind that they've taken from other artists and other songs and blues artists. Um, but Led Zeppelin, this is my favorite album of theirs, the debut. I love the sound of this record. It just seems to breathe more uh, and speak to me more than their later records, even though, of course, you can't deny the record. I'm not going to even try to uh, debate this with a Led Zeppelin freak. Okay, not going to do it. Now, this would be my number two or number three favorite band, probably number two, uh, the Kinks. And, of course, uh, this is the American version of Preservation uh, Society, We, the Village Green Preservation Society. Possibly their best album, this and Arthur. Uh, Ray Davis is probably the second or third after Lennon McCartney, best songwriter of the UK of that period. What a great lyricist, great songwriter, melody. He made great records. He produced a lot, most of his records, too. He knew it. It was great. He had people like Nicky Hopkins um, and other people occasionally uh, supplementing uh, the Kinks. But any version of the Kinks, even their Arista years, I love the show, theatrical years of RCA, the Kinks. King Crimson. These will probably be... 20 to 30 or 30 to 40 on the countdown if I was to include it. But this changed things. I bought this right when it came out. This is sort of my real first introduction to Prague and the Court of the Crimson King. I love Greg Lake's vocal. I love the, the syncopation of the band and the changes. And uh, it's kind of when Prague was fun for me before it got overly pretentious. And I'll leave it at that. Joy Division from Manchester. An important band, obviously, uh, us on the this side of the pond never saw them because Ian Curtis tragically died just prior to their American tour. Uh, this is my original uh, imported copy. I got these records right when they came out. And then Love Will Tear Us Apart. I have a 12-inch UK original of that. It was just an amazing record. Um, and they were very different. The whole Manchester scene, the factory scene, uh, I love uh Joy Division, and I love that. Now, I did not include, I just realized, New Order. I love that first album with Peter Seville, the, fl the flowers on the cover, and I probably could have picked that, but I really, you know, they they went a different direction. I really didn't follow them, I do, at, even though I appreciate them, and they got even, they got massive, but I didn't follow them. Um, then there's, <laughs> I just want to do that. Uh, Jethro Tull, stand up to me what i love about them you know they cross over in that prog world but they have a lot of uh, traditional english scottish irish uh, sense that they got folk they're like a folk prog band and i just love that I like the the addition of the the flute playing by ian anderson um the guitar play. i mean this is just a really great record their first few records i'd say it started going downhill 
starting with Passion Play. Uh, they've had bits of brilliance and great songs after that. Passion Play, to me, was a magnificent failure uh, after Thick as a Brick. So there you go. Also from Manchester, we're talking about Manchester, The Hollies. And of course, what a great, the great vocals of Alan Clark and, and Graham Nash especially, but they got this kind of neo-psychedelic stuff uh, a little while, and I really loved that. Um, you know, they were kind of a pop band again early on, but um, anyway, a lot of great hits, a lot of great singles. So most people see them as a singles band. This album is called Evolution, and I think it's a fantastic record. It's a later reissue. And we got Fleetwood Mac. Now, in my U.S. video, people were saying, how come you didn't include Fleetwood Mac? I will never consider them an American band. Obviously, once Buckingham and Nix joined, and they were California-based, they were like that California 70s iconic band. But the DNA, the nucleus, the rhythm section is all British. And even before Buckingham and Nix, they got you know Bob Welch, and they, they had the British... Uh, uh, excuse me, the American components uh, mixed in there. But it started with Peter Green. And to me, uh, it ended with Peter Green in terms of that classic. Of course, I like the ones after this with uh, Future Games and Bear Trees and Kiln House. But this then play on. This is that 1970 record that to me brings it all together. The blues, the songwriting, the song Oh Well on here. Uh, what a great, great band. Um, I can't say enough of uh, this album and the British Fleetwood Mac. To me, the real Fleetwood Mac. Not the most popular Fleetwood Mac, but they will always be... That's the Fleetwood Mac that I will always connect with. You know, I love Rumors, and I love the self-titled, and I love Tusk, actually. But after that, you know, for me. Now, this is a band that would be in my top 20, definitely, in this album... Leaves and Leaf, uh, Fairport Convention. Now, I should have included Pentangle, and I just realized the association of the folk rock thing, uh, J Joe Boyd producing this album. Uh, this is a perfect album. Sandy Denny and Richard Thompson, and they, they're still together in one form or another, not with those members, but they really bring out uh, traditional English music and adding a rock formula to it, a rock uh, component. And it's, they're so successful in what they've done. Pentangle has a little more jazzy feel, more total acoustic to the most part. But um, I love both these bands. And there, there's others I could have gone on with. Credible String Band, uh, The Straubs, but that's the one. And I it shouldn't be, again, one over the other, but that's the one and Pentangle. Those two connect with me a lot. Now, I'm, for this band, since there are kind of two bands, I included The Small Faces and The Faces. Uh, because, you know, Steve Marriott leaves uh, the small faces and Ronnie Lane's still there. So he's the heart and soul of this band. And, of course, Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood, and they get tall and they become not so small. Uh, Ooh La La, a great song. There's a great sort of a folky, traditional side to it with some really gritty rock and roll. Just a great rock band. And they became more of a great rock band here, even though you got the greatness of Steve Marriott here, but this poppy thing, Ichigo Park. I mean, I have to, I had to show the first Small Faces just to sh showcase and mention Ichigo Park, one of the great records with that kind of phasing effect coming through or crosses around you in stereo, so good. He likes it, Light Orchestra. You know, and as I present these, see, I forgot the move. The move should be on this list, but that would make it closer to 50. ELO, my favorite album is uh, El Dorado here. Jeff Lynn, of course, uh, they came from the move. The move morphed into ELO with Roy Wood and um, them. And, you know, you can't deny how great Jeff Lynn was. He's got a vision. But to me, this is the perfect thing before they get too compressed and too, um, even though I love Bev Bevan's bombastic drumming, uh, the way it's produced. I, this, to me, is a great... I mean, the, from the overture on, and they kind of tried to replicate this for the subsequent records, but uh, with this great clip from The Wizard of Oz, uh, ELO's El Dorado, great record. The Clash. Fortunate enough to see them twice. 
three times. One, um, one when um, Mick Jones left, but twice with Mick Jones. And um, this, this is like a great, this is the maturest punk album ever made. You know, maybe Sandinista. I like Sandinista. Some people think it's bloated with all the dub thing. Three records that could have been cut down, but I just love it the way it is. But this is the one uh, for so many reasons. And um, that's it, The Clash. This is my original mono uh, copy of Reaction Records of the second Cream record. This is this perfect blend. This basically has these straight blues songs, psychedelicized, for that term, psychedelicized, adding the wah-wah, adding the rhythm, adding the lyric, lyrical content uh, on here. And this, to me, is a perfect record. Now, I prefer the stereo, really, but the mono's got a different element to it. It's more of a, a tighter record, maybe. But I still like that kind of... I love stereo when it comes to psychedelia. And uh, what, they lasted less than two years, you know? Fresh Cream, Israeli Gears, Goodbye. Oh, the uh, live album, Wheels of Fire. One live, one studio. With pressed hat, Warthog and White Room. But of course, Sunshine of Your Love. Uh, all the songs on this, I mean, every song on this is great. The Cure, their new album, is really good. It's a whole different thing than what they were doing here. They're one of those bands, I forgot that they've lasted this long. I think there was a maybe a 15, even 20-year period where I kind of forgot about The Cure, aside from their first albums. I saw them in a club, the I-Beam on Hate Street. I love them. I mean, um, the vocals sound exactly the same today as they did then. Uh, they were a unique band because they weren't really post-punk. They came in the what, early 80s with this sound. Um, it's not psychedelia. There's a hard dirginess to it. It's a darkness to it. They're a little goth uh, in a way, and they mixed a lot of uh, fusing idioms. I remember first seeing them, and they opened up with the track, I think from um, their second album or third album when I saw them. Is that when I saw them? at the I-Beam, and it went on for about 15 minutes before they even started. It was like a slow locomotive buildup before they even, you know, sang a tune. And Robert Smith's voice uh, was great. He's got a really unique voice. If you don't like his voice, you're not going to like the band, because that's, that's it, really. There's no, like, great harmony vocals like a lot of other bands, and uh, but he still sounds exactly the same today. One of the great bands and one of the great metal bands uh, of the time is uh, Black Sabbath. The, I saw them once right after this record came out, I believe, between the second and third record. And um, I just love this record, you know? I'm not a big metal guy. Those of you who watch me know that. But I like the Black Sabbath with Ozzy Osbourne. I, I'm, I'm, those are great records to me. I just... For whatever reason, I just didn't follow them up after that. So, but you can't deny they're one of the great British bands. And 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 someone's going to be screaming here. There's all these great British metal bands. I they just didn't connect with me, and I'd never followed them. So that's for another channel. Go to Vital Richie. I think he shows a few. Now, to me, a perfect album. They, these would be my top fifteen bands. And that's the Bee Gees from Manchester area. Uh, they emigrate to Australia, then they come back and they record this wonderful record. To me, this is a perfect psychedelic Baroque pop masterpiece. 1967, they give Sgt. Pepper a run. It's really well recorded. The, the harmonies of the brothers, brotherly harmony is always a great thing. The cover by Klaus Vormann, uh, the bass player for Manfred Mann, German uh, artist who drew, illustrated the cover of uh, The Beatles' Revolver. Uh, the Bee Gees, what a wonderful record. Holiday, New York Mining Disaster, um, Every Christian Lionhearted Man. And one of my favorite things on here is uh, Please Read Me. And there's a wonderful cover of that song uh, by um, Nina Simone, who covered several Bee Gees songs. And of course, you know, they had their moment in 67, 68, had some huge singles and kind of dissipated. Not creatively, but uh, commercially. And of course, Saturday Night Fever and the whole disco and staying alive thing changed everything for them. Became massive. It turned off some people with that rivalry of uh, disco and killing disco. But they 
those are great records. And the Bee Gees made great records leading up to that. You know, Nights on Broadway, uh, just, you know, great record. The Animals, I mean, their version of the traditional House of the Rising Sun is, is epic, and it was a massive AM hit. Of course, um, Eric Burton, one of the great blue-eyed soul singers, great influence by um, by blues music, and they cover it. They were a blues band. They were like the Yardbirds. The Yardbirds, another band I neglected to include. I should have included the Yardbirds. See, when you do this, there's more. That's why it can't be done. For I cannot rank my favorite 25 British albums, I don't think. And there'd be so many more missing. So, uh, Alan Price, a great keyboard player. Oh, Alan Price, there he is, Alan Price, the other Alan Price. Great keyboard player. Um, I wish he stayed with the band more, but he wanted to do his own thing. He was really into the, a different kind of bluesy, jazzy thing, uh, like Georgie Fame and um, those artists, Mose Allison, and he did, did the soundtrack to A Lucky Man, which was fantastic. And then, of course, you got the bass player, Chaz Chandler, who would leave, too, and discover and manage Jimi Hendrix. Uh and they became a different band without these animals, Eric Burton and the animals later, uh, and did some great stuff with Monterey and uh, the psychedelic stuff, which is great. Sky Pilot, I love that stuff too, but it's very different than this. Blues covers on here as well, and um, House of the Rising Sun, The Girl Can't Help It. So a lot of covers, okay? Memphis, Tennessee, but really great workings of it. Very, very tight, really wonderful. They weren't that flashy guitar thing like uh, the Yardbirds with all the great guitar gods at the time. They were not like that, a different thing. And of course, definitely the number one band would be the Beatles. And I only saw Charge and Pepper because this changed everything in terms of albums. Album artwork, album music, is it their best? No, I don't think so. I think Revolver I would pick. But this is an important album, especially if you were there at the time. Looking back, 60 almost 60 years you can't imagine uh how important and how different this album was i mean people were looking and reading the lyrics on here and listening to this record for months after this came out in in june of 1967 it's it's an epic album it's an important album you know it's the equivalent of the big blockbuster movies of the 70s like star wars and jaws but better definitely better so Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band with a great Peter Blake design cover, photographed by Michael Cooper, um, an art piece. You know, does it hold up? I think it does. And it has a great piece of music that a lot of people didn't really get at the time of Within You, Without You. And probably one of the two best Beatle recordings ever, A Day in the Life. I would say recording-wise, not necessarily songs, but recording A Day in the Life and Strawberry Fields are the two most dramatic records the Beatles ever made. Both John Lennon, well, Paul McCartney too, definitely. That's it, the best I could do for you. Sorry about that. Uh, but you saw some English music and most of those you like. And I'm gonna have a comment like I did last time, the same old shit as he loves you.